Motives are avoided in the species approach simply because they create specific points of interest and tend to require continuation. They create expectations. This is an example of an important general principle. Avoid attracting the listener's attention to a salient detail and then doing nothing to follow up. This is why, once we start using them, usually the whole passage will focus on one or two motives, repeated with variations. Little bits of scale and suspensions are of course common everywhere, I call these neutral lines, whereas real motives stand out more and call for further development. In fact, learning to use motives intelligently is a first step toward learning to develop a musical idea. I cover motivic development in great detail in my composition textbook, Musical Composition, Craft and Art, published by Yale University Press. So here we'll limit our discussion to what's essential for contrapuntal situations. A motive is a short, memorable pattern, but it can't simply be literally repeated very often. It gets boring, but we can vary it to add interest. Let's look at a few of the ways to do that. In this example, number one is the given motive. It has a characteristic rhythm, four eighth notes followed by a quarter note, as well as a pitch pattern, up a fifth, twice down a second, and then up a fourth. In number two, the motive undergoes the simplest transformation, transposition. The scale position changes, but the pattern remains very easily recognizable. Number three simply extends the last part of the motive. Number four comes back to the first part of the motive, the leap. Number five inverts the motive. Whatever went up now goes down and vice versa. Number six plays the motive backwards. This is called retrograde. This is the first variant we've seen where the connection to the original is not immediately obvious. Number seven keeps the rhythm, but now the pitch pattern is expanded to contain huge leaps. Again, we're more struck by the difference than the similarity to the original. Number eight changes the rhythm drastically. This is even less obviously related to the original even though the pitches are exactly the same. Finally, number nine keeps the rhythm, but changes the pitch pattern completely. Again, the resemblance is not clear. The important point here is the distinction between close variants, where the listener immediately recognizes the connection with the original, and more remote variants, where the first reaction is, uh, the point here is not whether there is some connection with the original, but whether the listener instinctively recognizes it at first hearing. Notice that I said hearing. What's visually salient can be quite different from what we notice when listening. Certain kinds of changes are much more likely to puzzle the listener than others. For example, changing stepwise motion into leaps tend to obscure the association with the original. The opposite, however, leaps into steps is less of a problem. Adding strong rhythmic contrasts, like in number eight above, also changes the character quite a lot. For our purposes here, we're only interested in close motivic variants. These allow us to use motives in ways which add focus and character to our counterpoint, in order to give the feeling that we're actively developing a musical idea. When the same motive appears right away in another part of the texture, it creates imitation. Let's do an example of imitation in three parts. This will be the first time we do a counterpoint with no given part. How to proceed? Well, here's the first sketch, using the motive we examined above.
Notice that most bars in the sketch contain at least one voice doing the motive. The overall feel is like a conversation around one subject. The result is much more focused than in species counterpoint. Only measure 8 is just a scale instead of the basic motive. As I said before, occasional neutral lines like this, bits of scale, standard suspensions, are part of most motivic counterpoint. They let the music breathe a bit and allow the lines a bit more flexibility. If every moment of every line is motivic, the result can become obsessive, even suffocating. Neutral lines are also useful as counterpoints accompanying motives, so they don't distract the listener from the main focus. Notice the suspensions in measure 3 and 4, and the bass line from measure 6 to the end. In a harmonically organized counterpoint like this, the bass line creates direction, and along with the imitations of the main motive, it's a priority when sketching. The striking leap of a seventh in measure 10, from A down to B in the top part, stands out, but since it announces the cadence, that's not a bad thing. Now let's hear the finished version. The added parts here always clarify and enrich the harmony. Sometimes they also make passing reference to the main motive or parts of it, like in measure 2, where the last two beats of the bass start the motive, even though they don't finish it. Other things to notice here. The many accented passing tones, measure 1, 3, 4, 6, 7, and 9. Also, the only time the motive leaps to a dissonance is in measure 10 in the middle part. This, and the anticipation in the top line, C to C, only work because the cadence is a special moment worth which should stand out. The starting motive is the core of this little piece, and when it's absent, which is never very long, the lines are rather neutral so as not to distract from the overall character. Again, the general impression is that of a conversation around a given subject. When an imitation starts before the first presentation of the motive is over, as in measure 1, it's called stretto imitation. Whole passages of stretto imitation are possible, but difficult to realize well. We'll have a lot more to say about stretti later on in the course when we talk about fugue. The student should invent several motives and do short imitative examples like the one above, for now only in three parts. It's important to avoid motives with super strong contrasts, for example, containing very short and very long notes, since they can be hard to manage in such a short piece. Here's an example showing various common errors. There are many problems here, especially in the harmony. First, in the second half of measure 2, the combined parts can't seem to quite agree on the harmony. Same thing happens in the first two beats of measure 5. Second, in measure 3, the bass C sharp, a fourth, is unresolved. Third, the seventh in measure 4 on the second half of the second beat is unresolved, and the rest of the bar is harmonically very crude. Fourth, the harmony in the third beat of measure 4 is ambiguous. Fifth, what's that B doing in the middle part in measure 6? Sixth, the movement from the perfect fifth at the end of measure 8 into a diminished fifth at the start of measure 9 in the outer parts is not very rich. These kinds of harmonic weaknesses are typical in tonal counterpoint by students who have not mastered tonal harmony. Unless you are at ease with intermediate level tonal harmony, it's impossible to write good tonal counterpoints. 
Now let's look at the contrapuntal problems here. First of all, the imitation in measure 2 has moved the motive over by one eighth note. That exchanges accented notes with unaccented notes, and the effect is clumsy and disconcerting. Second, the tenor stops abruptly at the end of measure 2. It sounds like an accident. 3. The rhythms in measure 2, the top part, measure 4 and 5 in all the parts, and measure 8 and 9 in the middle part are very square and uninteresting. 4. There are no suspensions anywhere, which also contributes to making the overall feeling very square. 5. There's a complete loss of momentum in measure 9, made even more prominent by the fact that we had 16th notes just before in measure 8. And finally, the middle part in measure 7 and 8 is simplistic and really boring. Here's an improved version. The student should compare the two versions in detail. Remember, keep your motives simple, use the bass line to clarify the harmony and create direction, aim for the richest harmony possible, distribute the rhythmic interest fairly equally between all the parts, and of course, sing and play. <laughs>